What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to Real Estate Today. We have some great topics for you. I am, again, Jeff Beggins, one of your hosts, along with my brothers. Craig Beck, at your service. And our birthday boy, brother. That's it. Another year older. Mr. Mike Puma. the best one yet. Another year of experience. Next level. Next level you. It's the next level you right here. Yeah, a few more white hairs. Yeah. <laughs> So what we're talking about today is talking about muting my phone for one. And number one, talking about the perceptions, right? The perceptions that force people into their decisions or non-decisions, their actions or inactions. And it's really kind of the world that they're living in and how that affects real estate. Then we're going to talk about a couple of uh, macro trends that are really driving consumer confidence, which and a long way around is kind of what we're talking about today. So let's start out, Mike and Craig. Let's talk about the whole concept of why people are or are not transacting right now. And does it really depend on these headlines? Does it really depend on what the rates are? Does, it, does the Fed rate matter? Does the election matter? Does, does that really matter? And if so, how much and why? Well, Mike, why don't you start that off with what we just talked about? Yeah, I mean, it's not not at an individual level, right? Those things matter when we look at things from a, a broader scale, but they don't matter to the individual consumer because rates could be 3%. But if I just lost my job, my wife just lost her job, we have a lot of personal things going on, it's not going to matter. I'm not going to transact, right? Because I'm not in a position or mindset to transact. And so my world is in chaos, even if the rest of the world isn't. And in the same way, you know, Craig just had a neighbor buy a $300,000 car. He's in a different spot. He's in a different headspace. He's in a different mindset than I am, right? The reality is our own existence in the, in the short term is what's resulting in the decisions we're making, right? Now, we have control over how we react to those things that are coming at us, good, bad, or indifferent. But the reality is that's our reality. Perception's reality and what's happening around me is how the bubble that I live in, that's how I'm going to perceive and make decisions. So I think that's the key to remember. And, and as we're talking to people, if they say, oh, now's the worst time ever to buy, you need to take a step back and say, okay, well, why do they think that, right? What are, what's going on in their world that is making them think that? And it could be a headline that they read, but it's probably not. It's probably that they have life happening to them and then the headline validates it, right? So we're, we're all human and we want to justify why we feel the way we feel. So I'm, I'm have life happening to me. Maybe I lost my job for a period of time. Then I'm on LinkedIn and I read an article that's like job, you know, people cuts, job cuts are happening everywhere. And I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, that's right. Yeah, this is happening to everyone. That's how all of a sudden now I start reaffirming that belief and then that's going to project out. So I think that's super important just to understand that whether someone has a really positive outlook right now or a really negative outlook, that's just their own perception of what's going on in their personal reality. And, and they're both right. They're all right. That's the interesting thing about this right now because the way the, way the world's become, and it's very interesting, is you can find a support for any thought you have, right? Any perspective you want to take, you can find somebody's position that will defend that position that you want to take. I can show you and talk to people that are really pumped up and pumping a couple hundred million dollars into a marketplace. And I can tell you on the same street, there's people that are hunkered down because the world's going to end and, and everything's going to crash, right? And I can find articles that support both of those comments, right? So it really depends on kind of internally what it, how do you make decisions too? And in, in your personal world, what's going on? Is that enough? Because some people can react just on those feelings and some people need a lot of external um, data, right? And the external data is there depending on the mood that you're in and depending on what support level you want. I mean, if I wanted to do something, I could back it up, say, this is an awesome thing. If I wanted to not do something, I can search on Yahoo and find an article that supports the reason why I should pause and not do it. Right. So that's, a, I think, a, a very key point on this right now, too, is do you really want to? Right. Reality, if you don't like your neighbors and you don't like your neighborhood and you want a different house and you can afford it, 
go buy a freaking house, right? A couple hundred bucks in the grand scheme of things is going to sort itself out. You can refi later. So if you really want to go get it, the world's not ending. There's nothing and bad nobody happening. Nobody can lend you money today unless you can qualify. So you're not going to get in trouble. It's not like it was in 2005 where anybody could over leverage themselves. And you're not allowed to over leverage because, you know, a lot of people say, oh my gosh, I'm afraid I don't want to overpay. It's impossible to overpay with lending, right? Because the banks physically will not let you overpay for a loan. They have something, a stopgap in place called a what? Appraisal. Appraisal. <laughs> Appraisal. Right. And the appraisal justifies the value. If the appraisal doesn't come in, they're not going to loan you the cash. Right. So, yeah, and they're also going to make sure a down payment, you got proof of funds, and you've got like a good credit score, and you're likely to repay. Those things, those days are gone, but the ninja. Yeah. Well, I mean, essentially, we all live in an algorithm. Right. I mean, I, it's funny to me how many people want to blame social media. And, you know, I think we could debate all day about the good and bad of social platforms and the people that create them. But the point of it is, is that we all live in an algorithm, even off of those platforms, right? But, you know, if I sit there and I search violent videos all day, guess what my feed is going to be filled with? Yep. Violent videos. And then uh, people are like, oh, my God, I can't believe they show violent videos on, on that platform. Um, I've never had a violent video in my, my feed, right? So what is that really saying? It's just the truth of what you're showing that you're interested in at that time. And so, yes, could you argue that it's not good that it sits there and feeds that to you? Sure. But we need to own the fact and be accountable to the fact that the things that are happening to us or the way we're perceiving things is the input that we're taking in. It's our own fault. And if you don't realize that you're in control over those inputs, then we've got bigger problems. So the reality is that Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, I don't care what you're on, those platforms have one job, and that is to keep you on that platform as long as possible. So their only mission is to show you content that you've shown time and time again that you're interested in and want to engage in. That's it, right? So if you don't engage in that, guess what? It stops showing it to you. So you have got to make the decision, be a grown up, and decide, you know what? I don't want to feed that my mind with that negativity. I don't want to believe that anymore. I, I need to shift my mindset. And if you do that, you're going to see a shift in the stuff that starts coming and those inputs are going to shift. But if you don't, it's your fault. It's deeper and scarier than that too, because with the algorithms, the way they do it now, right? They know when you're scrolling, right? And you stop, right? And it could be you're stopping because your dog did something. Or it's not because you're looking. They know when you're looking and they know how long you're looking. They know when you're clicking and seeing things. So your subconscious is creating the world that you live in, right? There's a, a Jimmy Buffett's on the world's what you make it. I was saying, I was listening to it with my son on the way to school this morning. And we're just kind of talking about that one. But your subconscious was interested in something, would stop the scroll, right? You might not have physically clicked deep into it, but you stopped and it got your attention. And the algorithm says, that's interesting. Stopped, looked wants more. So that will start feeding into your world. And then plus you want you actively do that. So your whole world, that was real interesting how you said that, Mike, because I've never got a weird violent video in my feed either. But there's some people that say, eh, everything's so negative. Everything's not so negative. You're the one that's negative because you're clicking on negative stuff and engaging with the negative stuff and you're and you're talking about it because they're listening to you too. So you're if you're sitting chattering about whatever negativity, positive, you're going to get that world. So the world truly is what you make it. On this well, yeah. And even off the platform, is your reticulator activating system not an algorithm? Right? Absolutely. I mean, it's literally, it's your brain saying, oh, look, Mike is thinking about buying a Jeep. And so what does Mike start perceiving more? Jeeps, 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 Jeeps right? I start, it's feeding me. That's an algorithm. It's literally what the algorithm is doing on a platform. We have that in our brains already. So if we're sitting there with a negative mindset and everything's ugly and it's raining outside, think about when it rains, right? I've thought about this before. When it rains in my head, like I automatically assume that it's like a shitty day everywhere, but it's not. There's somebody else sitting in another part of the country or the world that's got a beautiful sunny day, Shit, right? Their mindset's completely different, but like in my world, it's raining. So in my head, I automatically assume it's raining for everybody. This is literally just how humans work. 
right? But I think the more we understand that, the more control we can start to have over it. And, you know, I say all the time, I want everything to be my fault. I want the algorithm to be my fault. I want the input to be my fault because if it's my fault, I have the power to fix it. I have the power to change it. If it's not my fault, then that probably means I'm powerless, right? I don't have control over that. And so I like to focus on the things that I can control. And I think if we all do that, then we can start to really impact what we're feeding ourselves and what we're feeding our brain. So let's feed ourselves some real estate input for a second, right? And because you either are trending towards making a purchase or trending towards talking yourself out of making a purchase, right? Fair assumption? Well, I'm going to comment real quick because I'm reading a book right now that's relevant right here. It's it's called The Expectation Effect. Chris talked about it this morning. Uh, David Robson is the author. So if you're interested, The Expectation Effect, right? So if you eat ice cream and cake and you have an expectation that's going to make you fat, guess what? You're more likely to get fat by eating ice cream and cake. But if you have an expectation that eating ice cream, this is a little bit out there, but the expectation effect. So it's right in your own private world, right? If, if you hang around with nine smokers, you're going to be the 10th, right? Yep. If you hang around with nine drinkers, you're going to be the 10th. So who are you surrounding yourself? Where are you getting information from? And who chooses where you, what information you take in and where you get it from? The answer is you. Yep. So all these slides we have prepared to talk about really don't make a whole lot of sense because it depends on where you are in your mindset right now. Because if you might be listening to CNN and saying the world is coming to an end, we're going to war, the world's ending. Or you might be listening to Fox News saying, hey, rates are dropping, people are buying, and things are moving. Right? That's it. So let's talk, let's justify both for a second, right? Let's just be completely Switzerland on, on today, right? Let's talk. Let's build the case for buying now, and let's build the case for not buying now. Right. So, you, you want a new house, right? Let's let's say it's a, a move, a lock in. We call the lock in buyers, right? The lock in movers. They're locked into a low interest rate, and they logically don't see the benefit in moving because why trade a three and a half percent interest rate for a seven and a half percent interest rate? Doesn't make any logical sense, nope. right? So. That's that's my position. Change my mind on that. I'm not. I don't feel like moving right now. I, I don't. It's it's too much. I want to move, but I'm not going to do it. Trading a three and a half for a seven. Is there any justification for me to change my thinking? Sure. Why do you want to move? I want a let's, different. Let's layout. take let's take the let's take the finances out of out of it for a second. Let's say the rate doesn't matter. Nothing else matters. Why would why are you even thinking about moving to begin with? Well, this is what we were talking about in the be- at the end of last year, the beginning of this year. It's, it's the four Ds. People are not going to move unless they have to. But that's changed. This little slide right here says, the reason to believe that the rate lock-in effect will ease modestly this year as mortgage rates come down. And you could only imagine if they got below six that even more people would be, again, quote unquote, in the money. And homeowners will become less anchored to that low, low rate that they got a few years ago. So we're tied into, we've been saying for a decade now, These are generationally low rates. You're never going to see these again. Take advantage of them now while you can. And that lost its effect because we said it this year, 10 years ago, nine years ago, eight years ago, seven, et cetera. We've been saying, you better take advantage of these, better take advantage of these, better take advantage of these. And so people bought that. Now they're expecting that's it because it's been so consistent. But Jeff, to your point, that was always because of a pandemic, a global freaking shutdown of the world economy and a government that's scared and didn't know what to do. So they stimulated it. We are not in that situation now. You know, we happen to be in Florida for those of you that are not in Florida, and we're just super blessed. I mean, I would say probably 45 to 50% of our sales are out of state buyers moving to Florida. And we wish we had more houses to sell them or they were ready on time. Yep. I think to Jeff's point, though, right, just looking at it from situational, you know, I'll use myself in as, as an example. I, I have a very low fixed rate on my house should financially it would be stupid for me to ever sell this house. Mm-hmm. And my kids are locked in based on where we go to school. We want them to stay there. So I'm pretty locked in, right? If you will. But if you said that, eh, have you thought about buying? Yeah. Right. Wouldn't it be nice to have a newer house maybe with a little bit more space, maybe a room inside for a dedicated gym instead of having it in the garage or those things that would be nice to have. Sure. Am I going to uproot my life to get it right now? Nah, that'd be tough. 
But if Jeff came to me and said, listen, I get it. But what if you could, if I showed you a financial situation, right, mapped it out for you, where you could rent your current house out and have it make you money every month. Let's say maybe a thousand bucks cash flow every month. We go and find you a new house. You use the equity that you have in your current house. Now you got the cash for the down payment for that bigger, nicer, newer house that's in the same school district that has all the rooms that you want. And that thousand dollars a month, yes, the rate's gonna be there, but I think right now I can get you a rate buy down that's gonna get you down into the fives. We could probably refi that even later on to get you down to where you are now. Plus you have a thousand dollars contributing here and both now you have two assets that are gonna grow and really the only disruption to your life is you gotta move, right? That's it. But the house is right around the corner. It's in the same school zone. Everything is good. And ultimately your payments are essentially about the same, maybe a little bit more right now, but you could redo that later. Hmm. Now I'm interested, right? So that's how, that's the only reason you would do it or I'm not. And the reality is if you lay that out for me and I'm one of those people that's pretty locked in and I say, no, nah, I still wouldn't do it. Then I'm not ready to move. Right. And you need to move on. There's no, there's no scenario then. And I don't want those additional things that badly because if I did and financially it was about the same, I would make the move. Well, right? let's go. pause on that for a second. Right. Because this statement is just true. People don't change their mind. They make new decisions based on new information, right? So you're stuck in, in your mind, quote, it's stupid financially for me to move out of this home, okay? That's his position right now, and he's right. In his mind, he's right. And he will never change his mind. I will never change his mind because if I try to fight him to change his mind, he's going to battle me and we'll never, it'll never work out. But he could make a new decision based on new information, which is what he was just laying out. So as, as another let's another layer on there, say, okay, how long ago did you buy your house? Eight years ago. Eight years ago. Okay, so totally different climate eight years ago. And you bought it at a – What do you remember what your rate was when you bought it just by chance? Like 4.2, something like that. And then you refied lower than that during the pandemic rush. During the threes, yep. And down into threes, right? So that was a smart move. He paid attention to what was going on in the industry, in the market, in the globe. Well, let me rock your world. That may have been a smart move. It may not have been. Because it probably cost you 8000 bucks to do the refi. And it took your 30 mortgage and reset it to 30 years. And you're down to 22 years left to pay now. Nobody thinks about that. Right. Right. That's, that's a good point there, too. Because I'm saying it myself. I was like, Mike, I had a 4.25 and I refinanced to a three. But I was, you know, 15 years into a 30-year mortgage. Now I'm back to a 30-year mortgage. So I was double accelerating my payments. Right. Every action has a reaction, and you really. Need that. But you need them to start. You need to start having these conversations, to make people think, right? Because we can never change his mind. He's the only one that can change his own mind. We but can make new decisions based on new information. Payment one, 97 percent is interest, and three percent is principal. Yeah. 12 years in, it's 80 percent is is, is uh, interest, and 20 percent is principal. I'm knocking down principal like crazy. And I added money to the end of my loan. So now I got a bigger loan and I'm paying down less every month. So depending on where you were, it really takes a competent advisor who's not attached to the outcome to give you the advice that you want. Because here's what happens. People buy and then they justify with logic. So emotionally, I want to have a 3% rate and logically it's going to make my payment lower. But you don't think about, oh shit, I'm taking I'm back to a 30 year loan now. And I would just have this one paid off in 20 years or 15 right. years, whatever it was. But in the meantime, over eight years, he's built up a lot of equity, right? So I'm going, even with not turning that into a rental, he could, right? Now, what's the best way to get Mike to, to listen to this option? Is I could tell him a third-party story, right? Saying, hey, Mike, let me talk to you about another client I was talking to who had a, a similar thought. Totally locked in. This is not the time to sell whatsoever. My rates are too low. It doesn't make any sense to move up in a 7% rate. I'm in my in 3%, and I get it. So here's what we did. Here's what he and I went through. By doing this, what am I doing? I'm, I'm opening him up. I'm not attacking him. I'm letting him understand what somebody else is doing, right? So with these guys, we said, all right, so you bought it eight years ago. Over the course of those eight years, the property has accumulated about 350000 worth of equity, additional equity from when he actually purchased his home. That's great. Now, call that a brilliant move. Call it luck. Call it whatever it was. doesn't matter. It's free money that's sitting right there to be had. 
$350,000. So the question was, all right, so if you have a house that's $400,000 and you have a house that's $800,000 and you take a normal appreciation rate, three to 5%. Okay. What's five, let's do about 5%. With 5% appreciation on 400,000, it's how much a year? 20,000 a year. 20,000 a year. But 5% on 800,000 is? 40,000 a year. 40,000 a year. Okay. So could you take that, this, what he decided was he could take that 350,000 he made while he was sleeping, really did nothing for it, found an $800,000 house, was able to put that money down on the $800,000 house. His payments, granted, is a higher rate. He was able to use some of that money for a buy down to buy the rate down a little bit. But now he offsets his depreciation, has much higher appreciation and a better quality of life. And then the house is going up into a different neighborhood, a little better view, better different lifestyle. So when you actually put all when we put it all together, it was a couple hundred dollar a month swing. But he was making an extra twenty thousand dollars a year in appreciation right on this one. So it all depends on what you want. So by just doing a conversation like that, all true. Right. I unlocked a thought. Right. And that's all I want to do is get him off that position of being stuck on that rock of I will not do it. It's stupid financially. Right. Well, if somebody else was in the same thought. They they freed themselves and realized it might not have been a, a none. And now later, when he puts his head on his pillow, one of those thoughts that come through later on in the day is, well, that's true. let me think about that for a second. What if we did that? Starts doing some calculator, takes out his phone, goes to the mortgage app and says, huh, interesting. Right. And then he's now open to an opportunity if a house comes in now to his reticular activating system. If now he becomes open, he might see an ad in his Instagram on um, some one of his agent friends. And he says, that's a cool pool. Click. Right. And then he starts to see that it's 825 and he goes down the rabbit hole. He shows Courtney what it is. And then now the conversations are flowing when there's opportunities. Right. So what I'm talking about is for all of you watching right now, whether you're in the industry or not in the industry, just understand that there is nothing locked, right? There is no solid, there is no given, right? There is no position that's not unmovable. It depends on, guys, we're here for however long we're here, right? And we're here to have a great life and have some cool experiences and live in a freaking nice house, for God's sakes, right? Be where you wanna be. You can afford it, right? You just need somebody to kind of walk through scenarios to figure out how to get that to happen. Live where you wanna live. Right? Who cares what your Uncle Bob said? It doesn't matter. He's not you. right? Figure it out. What kind of lifestyle you want to be in. Let's figure out the finances. Figure out how to make it happen and do it. And like I'm telling people that are buying right now, this is the worst it's ever going to be. You're not going to be able to buy a home that you can't afford. The lenders won't let you. You can't overpay for a home. The lenders won't let you. So go see what you truly qualify for. Go shopping. Figure out if you want to live there. Because if you can afford that home right now, it might suck right now because you're paying seven and a half percent. But you, every one of us knows that that's not going to be the case in a year from now. There's no, there's nobody, nobody is saying that rates are going to be higher than this a year from now. Not, not one person. And let's not give them the gratification. You might go to get qualified and find out you can't. But it doesn't mean you can't for sure. But well, whatever you qualify for, you have that opportunity to go buy that. And if you can afford that payment, which you would, or you wouldn't be approved for it. It's only, this is the worst it's ever going to be, right? This payment you don't like is only going to get better from here because as rates drop, especially if you lock into a mortgage program that allows you to restructure your rate without a refinance, because sometimes it's three to 4% to your point, Greg, right, right? To refinance a home, you go to like a Navy Fed or other lenders are catching suit now and they allow you to adjust your rate down every six months. There's all kinds of options that are coming in. We got 40 year amortization loans coming out now over yep. here too. So the free market changes everything. But the opportunity is there. So get approved, buy what you can afford to buy comfortably where you are, and then it's only going to get better from here. So yeah, but I want to say, them. if you can't yeah. qualify, it's not the end of the world. It just means you got to do a couple things to fix your credit score, to fix your um, down payment necessity. Maybe you go through some payment down payment assistance programs. We have lots of tools to help you get qualified if you're not qualified now. So let's go, let go of the instant gratification. And let's work yeah. on consolidating some debt, getting your credit score fixed. Little things like that go a long way. So maybe it's six months or a year away, but it shouldn't stop you from making the tr decision to get excited about the future. Right. And there's all kinds of options, right? If you Let's say you found a, a, a house that in your neighborhood that's the, the house in the neighborhood that weeds are growing, it's been vacant, somebody died, whatever the case may be, and it pops up and you want to do it because you see a flip opportunity. 
you can get hard money loans for things like that, for renovation loans to do things, even, even if your credit's not great, right? There's always people that will loan money for a project that makes sense, right? So that's what you need to happen. So kind of what we want to get through to you today is just free yourself, right? And, and go do what you want to go do. And don't let a headline or a rate change um, your mind, right? Because once the rates go down, a lot of people are going to rely on their third party um, blessings to go by. And that's when you're going to get screwed because all it takes is two people to create a bidding war and lose all the leverage in a negotiation, right? If I'm, if I'm negotiating on one house, on Mike's house, it's just me. I'm the only thing around. He's got to work with me. As soon as Craig enters the pictures and starts bidding against me or even at the same price, the cockiness curve switches completely. And now I have no leverage. I'm not getting anything extra. And it just changes. So it just takes one more person looking at the exact same home um, to change the market completely for yourself. So take advantage of the time that we have right now where some people are locked in to their thinking, right? And just kind of tiptoe around them and go snatch some nice properties and then refi them later. I guess that's the, that's the point on that. Sounds like a call. That's it. That's it. So let's talk about Fed for a minute. Let's talk about projections because they've ch they're changing. Right, they're There's changing. Right there. Mortgage rate projections. You guys are seeing it on the screen right now. Q1 of 24, 7%. Or they were 7% in December. They're 6.4 in January. The projections for Q2 will be 6.2. Projections for Q3, 6.0. Projections for Q4, 5.8. Guys, that's hardly moving the needle. I was going to say, it's almost irrelevant. It is. Take your mortgage calculator and figure the difference with a 0.2% interest rate. That's not going to keep you from buying a house. That's one it's night, good. not at all a part. Emotion they justify by okay. with logic, right? Right. The emotion is, I want a new house. Like, oh, rates are falling, so I should. this is just justifies me buying now. So 6.4 to 6.2 is a pimple on a gnat's behind. Don't do it. Don't even worry about it. The <laughs> only thing that changes, if, if you see the feds come out and something happens in the economy, which... Don't wish for it, guys. Right? No, if you're wishing for a half point or a point drop, it's never going to happen again unless we have a pandemic. So don't be wishing stuff like that on anybody because the only way you're going to get a half a point correction or something massive drop, which is, means the economy screwed and they're trying to do CPR on it to bring it back to life. And nobody wins in that environment. Well, so let's take the interpretation of this graph right here. Yeah. So if I wait, this is first quarter 2024. If I wait till the end of the year, I can get a half a point lower. 0.6. That's Maybe. just savings. But what's going to happen to the home price? I mean, I can show you here. Home price appreciation is four has to be five or six percent this year. So your four hundred thousand dollar house a year from now with a five percent appreciation is twenty thousand dollars more. So now you have your four hundred thousand dollars is four twenty. So what if you get a five point eight percent rate instead of six point four? You're paying for a four twenty house instead of a four hundred thousand dollar house. That's right. Payment's going to be the same. Right. And if rates drop down and the normal um, once the mentality, the herd mentality comes out, everybody's going to wait for the 5.8. Now you're competing with 700 people to get the same house. And now it's not 440, it's 448 because it went up in an escalation clause battle. Right. <laughs> and it doesn't make sense. So the, 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 not be true, right? The time to buy a house is when you want to freaking buy a house, right? And go get it. And there's, uh, if you want to, if we needed to bust out a long-term appreciation graph, you're not going to go wrong. Real, great real estate held long term is the best, best investment you've ever possibly make in your life. Get as much of it as you possibly can along the way. Right, Jeff, you lived in your house for how long now? Eight years in this current one. So you're probably you, it's easily doubled from what I know what you paid for. I know what it's worth now. Mike, you've been in yeah. your house for eight years. What's what's appreciation? You've been have you doubled? Uh, yeah, we're sitting. We've gained probably four hundred thousand, five hundred thousand in the last eight years. I've been in my house for 24 years now and it's a new home and I, it's a, it's a quintuple. I've got five times, five X the yeah. value of my house from when I bought it. Typical seller. I'm in a, I've been in my home for 24 years and it's a new home. <laughs> I put a new roof on it three years ago. Damn it. <laughs> typical. typical seller. I'm going to talk one last point real quick. If you're a seller, right? You're really a buyer in most cases because you want to be moving around. There are this is the time because inventory is super tight right now. And now as rates do drop, it will be better, but they're not going to drop significantly. 
there, there's going to be people just coming into the market, trickling in and more and more and more trickling in, but there's not going to be a race hurt, right? If the Fed comes out and drops half a point, I don't see it happening. I, just, I don't, right? I see it coming down and consumer confidence coming in, but all you need is just people feeling good that it's a downward trend, right? So as a seller, get on the market, especially in this time like this, we're in the peak selling season for a reason, because this is the time people are looking and buying. So to sit and wait in this time of the year does not make any sense. This is the time to get out there and maybe, right, with a big asterisk, depending on your specific micro market and what you're actually competing against right now. And a good agent is going to tell you whether or not this is a good time. If you don't have to sell, then you need to strategically time the market when it's the right time for you to slip in when there's nothing else on the shelf that you're competing with. So you can become get the highest dollar that you can. It's all a game. It's all a strategy. It's all strategic positioning. And you need a good person to advise you on that micro market. There is no market, guys. It is what else is happening in your area, your neighborhood, like kind properties that are finished the same way yours are, same exposure, same pool, same garages, whatever it may be. So get a good agent to advise you when the right time to pounce is. And it's probably very soon. Hey, I just came up with a really simple math equation. Okay. Just to take normal today, a four hundred thousand dollars house is about a twenty five hundred dollars a month mortgage payment, right? Twenty five hundred dollars one times twelve is thirty thousand a year, and that asset goes up about twenty thousand a year if the forecast are right at a five percent appreciation. That's twenty thousand bucks. So it costs you thirty thousand dollars to own the home, and it goes up twenty thousand dollars a year. So what did it really cost to own the home? Ten thousand dollars a month. What is that? It's wait, 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 but 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 wait, there's more. That's right. right? You get taxes. What do you get to do on your taxes every year? Mm -hmm. Right off that interest, baby. And how much of that twenty grand a year in interest payments is going to be taxes? Well, thirty percent. Almost So it makes sense to buy. That's yep. the point. Moral of the story. Call All right. So we have one compensation. We'll guide you through the process. You got it. You got it. Well, thanks for watching, guys. That is our update for this week, and we will see you back next week with another episode of Real Estate Today. Mm -hmm.